Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On SnoozeCast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please review us on Apple Podcasts and also share it with a friend. This episode is brought to you by a long hug from an old friend. Tonight, I'll be reading from a book called The Oregon Trail, Sketches of Prairie and Rocky Mountain Life by Francis Parkman. It was originally serialized in Knickerbocker's magazine and subsequently published as a book in 1849. Parkman's excursion led him only along the first third, the flat stretch of the 2100-mile trail. He never saw the cruelest parts across the mountains and deserts. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Chapter 2 Breaking the Ice Both Shaw and myself were tolerably inured to the vicissitudes of traveling. We had experienced them under various forms, and a birch canoe was as familiar to us as a steamboat. The restlessness, the love of wilds and hatred of cities, natural perhaps in early years to every unperverted son of Adam, was not our only motive for undertaking the present journey. My companion hoped to shake off the effects of a disorder that had impaired a constitution originally hardy and robust, and I was anxious to pursue some inquiries relative to the character and usages of the remote Indian nations, being already familiar with many of the border tribes. Emerging from the mud hole, where we last took leave of the reader, we pursued our way for some time along the narrow track in the checkered sunshine and shadow of the woods, till at length, issuing forth into the broad light, we left behind us the farthest outskirts of that great forest that once spread unbroken from the western plains to the shore of the Atlantic. Looking over an intervening belt of shrubbery, we saw the green, ocean-like expanse of prairie stretching swell over swell to the horizon. It was a mild, calm spring day, a day when one is more disposed to musing and reverie than to action, and the softest part of his nature is apt to gain the ascendancy. I rode in advance of the party as we passed through the shrubbery and as a nook of green grass offered a strong temptation. I dismounted and lay down there. All the trees and saplings were in flower or budding into fresh leaf. The red clusters of the maple blossoms and the rich flowers of the Indian apple were there in profusion. And I was half inclined to regret leaving behind the land of gardens for the rude and stern scenes of the prairie and the mountains. Meanwhile, the party came in sight from out of the bushes. Foremost rode Henry Cotillion, our guide and hunter, a fine athletic figure, mounted on a hardy gray Wyandotte pony. He wore a white blanket coat, a broad hat of felt, moccasins and pantaloons of deerskin, ornamented along the seams with rows of long fringes. His knife was stuck in his belt. His bullet pouch and powder horn hung at his side, and his rifle lay before him, resting against the high pommel of his saddle, which, like all of his equipments, had seen hard service and was much the worse for wear. Shaw followed close, mounted on a little sorrel horse, 
and leading a larger animal by a rope. His outfit, which resembled mine, had been provided with a view to use rather than ornament. It consisted of a plain black Spanish saddle with holsters of heavy pistols, a blanket rolled up behind it, and the trail rope attached to his horse's neck hanging coiled in front. He carried a double-barreled smooth bore, which I boasted a rifle of some fifteen pounds weight. At that time our attire, though far from elegant, bore some marks of civilization, and offered a very favorable contrast to the intimidable shabbiness of our appearance on the return journey. A red flannel shirt, belted around the waist like a frock, then constituted our upper garment. Moccasins had supplanted our failing boots, and the remaining essential portion of our attire consisted of an extraordinary article, manufactured out of smoked buckskin. Our muleteer, Delorier, brought up the rear with his cart, waddling ankle-deep in the mud, alternately puffing at his pipe and ejaculating in his prairie patois, Sacra Enfant de Gas, as one of the mules would seem to recoil before some abyss of unusual profundity. The cart was of the kind that one may see by scores around the marketplace in Montreal, and had a white covering to protect the articles within. These were our provisions and a tent, with ammunition, blankets, and presents for the Indians. We were in all four men, with eight animals, for besides the spare horses led by Shaw and myself, an additional mule was driven along with us as a reserve in case of accident. After this summing up of our forces, it may not be amiss to glance at the characters of the two men who accompanied us. Deloyer was a Canadian, with all the characteristics of the true Jean-Baptiste. Neither fatigue, exposure, nor hard labor could ever impair his cheerfulness, gaiety, or his obsequious politeness to his bourgeois. And when night came, he would sit down by the fire, smoke his pipe, and tell stories with the utmost contentment. In fact, the prairie was his congenial element. Henry Cotillion was of a different stamp. When we were at St. Louis, several gentlemen of the fur company had kindly offered to procure for us a hunter and guide suited for our purposes. And on coming one afternoon to the office, we found there a tall and exceedingly well-dressed man with a face so open and frank that it attracted our notice at once. We were surprised at being told that it was he who wished to guide us to the mountains. He was born in a little French town near St. Louis, and from the age of 15 years had been constantly in the neighborhood of the Rocky Mountains, employed for the most part by the company to supply their forts with buffalo meat. As a hunter, he had but one rival in the whole region, a man named Simoneau, with whom, to the honor of both of them, he was on terms of the closest friendship. He had arrived at St. Louis the day before, from the mountains, where he had remained for four years, and he now only asked to go and spend a day with his mother before setting out on another expedition. His age was about thirty. He was six feet high and very powerfully and gracefully molded. The prairies had been his school. He could neither read nor write, but he had a natural refinement and delicacy of mind. His manly face was a perfect mirror of uprightness, simplicity, and kindness of heart. He had, moreover, a keen perception of character and a tact that would preserve him from flagrant error in any society. 
He was content to take things as he found them, and his chief fault arose from an excess of easy generosity, impelling him to give away too profusely even to thrive in the world. Yet it was commonly remarked of him that whatever he might choose to do with what belonged to himself, the property of others was always safe in his hands. His bravery was as much celebrated in the mountains as his skill in hunting, but it is characteristic of him that in a country where the rifle is the chief arbiter between man and man, Henry was very seldom involved in quarrels. Once or twice, indeed, his quiet good nature had been mistaken and presumed upon, but the consequences of the error were so formidable that no one was ever known to repeat it. No better evidence of the intrepidity of his temper could be wished than the common report that he had killed more than thirty grizzly bears. He was a proof of what unaided nature will sometimes do. I have never, in the city or in the wilderness, met a better man than my noble and true-hearted friend, Henry Cotillion. We were soon free of the woods and bushes, and fairly upon the broad prairie. Now and then, a Shano passed us, riding his little shaggy pony at a lope, his calico shirt, his gaudy sash, and the gay handkerchief bound around his snaky hair fluttering in the wind. At noon, we stopped to rest not far from a little creek replete with frogs and young turtles. There had been an Indian encampment at the place, and the framework of their lodges still remained, enabling us very easily to gain a shelter from the sun by merely spreading one or two blankets over them. Thus shaded, we sat upon our saddles, and Shaw, for the first time, lighted his favorite Indian pipe, while the loyer was scotted over a hot bed of coals. Shading his eyes with one hand and holding a little stick in the other, with which he regulated the hissing contents of the frying pan. The horses were turned to feed among the scattered bushes of a low, oozy meadow. A drowsy, spring-like sultriness pervaded the air, and the voices of ten thousand young frogs and insects, just awakened into life, rose in varied chorus from the creek and the meadows. Scarcely were we seated when a visitor approached. This was an old Kansas Indian, a man of distinction, if one might judge from his dress. His head was shaved and painted red, and from the tuft of hair remaining on the crown dangled several eagle's feathers, and the tails of two or three rattlesnakes. His cheeks, too, were daubed with vermilion. His ears were adorned with green glass pendants. A collar of grizzly bears' claws surrounded his neck, and several large necklaces of wampum hung on his breast. Having shaken us by the hand with a cordial grunt of salutation, the old man, dropping his red blanket from his shoulders, sat down cross-legged on the ground. In the absence of liquor, we offered him a cup of sweetened water, at which he ejaculated, good, and was beginning to tell us how great a man he was, and how many pawnies he had killed, when suddenly a motley concourse appeared wadding across the creek toward us. They filed past in rapid succession, men, women, and children. When they passed, we caught our horses, saddled, harnessed, and resumed our journey. 
Fording the creek, the low roofs of a number of rude buildings appeared, rising from a cluster of groves and woods on the left, and riding up through a long lane, amid a profusion of wild roses and early spring flowers, we found the log church and schoolhouses belonging to the Methodist Shano Mission. The Indians were on the point of gathering to a religious meeting. Some scores of them, tall men, were seated on wooden benches under the trees, while their horses were tied to the sheds and fences. Their chief, Parks, a remarkably large and athletic man, was just arrived from Westport, where he owns a trading establishment. Beside this, he has a fine farm. Indeed, the Shanos have made greater progress in agriculture than any other tribe on the Missouri frontier. And both in appearance and in character, form a marked contrast to our late acquaintance, the Kansas. A few hours' ride brought us to the banks of the river Kansas, traversing the woods that lined it and plowing through the deep sand. We encamped not far from the bank at the lower Delaware crossing. Our tent was erected for the first time on a meadow close to the woods, and the camp preparations being complete, we began to think of supper. An old Delaware woman of some 300 pounds weight sat in the porch of a little log house close to the water, and a very pretty girl was engaged under her superintendence in feeding a large flock of turkeys that were fluttering and gobbling about the door. But no offers of money or even tobacco could induce her to part with one of her favorites. So I took my rifle to see if the woods or the river could furnish us anything. A multitude of quails was plaintively whistling in the woods and meadows, but nothing appropriate to the rifle was to be seen, except three buzzards seated on the spectral limbs of an old dead sycamore. The thrust itself was out over the river from the dense, sunny wall of fresh foliage. Their heads were drawn down between their shoulders and they seemed to luxuriate in the soft sunshine that was pouring from the west. As they offered no temptations, I refrained from disturbing their enjoyment, but contented myself with admiring the calm beauty of the sunset, for the river, eddying swiftly in deep purple shadows between the impending woods, formed a wild, tranquilizing scene.